Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is by M. R. James. The Uncommon Prayer Book. Mr. Davidson was spending the first week in January alone in a country town. A combination of circumstances had driven him to that drastic course. His nearest relations were enjoying winter sports abroad, and the friends who had been kindly anxious to replace them had an infectious complaint in the house. Doubtless he might have found someone else to take pity on him. But, he reflected, most of them have made up their parties. And after all, it is only for three or four days at most that I will have to fend for myself, and it will be just as well if I can get a move on with my introduction to the Leventhorpe papers. I might use the time by going down as near as I can to Galsford and making acquaintance with the neighborhood. I ought to see the remains of the Leventhorpe house and the tombs in the church. The first day after his arrival at the Swan Hotel at Longbridge was so stormy that he got no farther than the tobacconists. The next, comparatively bright, he used for his visit to Galsford, which interested him more than a little, but had no ulterior consequences. The third, which was really a pearl of a day for early January, was too fine to be spent indoors. He gathered from his landlord that a favorite practice of visitors in the summer was to take a morning train to a couple of stations westward and walk down back along the valley of the tent, through Stanford St. Thomas and Stanford Magdalene, both of which were accounted highly picturesque villages. He closed with this plan, and we now find him seated in a third-class carriage at 9.45 a.m., on his way to Kingsburn Junction, and studying the map of the district. One old man was his only fellow traveler, a piping old man, who seemed inclined for conversation. So Mr. Davidson, after going through with the necessary versicles and responses about the weather, inquired whether he was going far. No, sir, not far. Not this morning, sir, said the old man. I ain't only going so far as what they call Kingsburn Junction. There isn't but two stations betwixt here and there. Yes, they call it Kingsburn Junction. I'm going there, too, said Mr. Davidson. Oh, indeed, sir. Do you know that part? No, I'm only going for the sake of taking a walk back to Longbridge and seeing a bit of the country. Oh, indeed, sir. Well, tis a beautiful day for a gentleman as enjoys a bit of walk. Yes, to be sure. Have you got far to go when you get to Kingsburn? No, sir, I ain't got far to go. Once I get to Kingsburn Junction, I'm a-going to see my daughter, sir. She live at Brockstone. It's about two mile across the fields from what they call Kingsburn Junction, that is. You've got that marked down on your map, I expect, sir. I expect I have. Let's see. Brockstone, did you say? Here's Kingsburn, yes. And which way is Brockstone toward the Stanfords? Ah, I see it. Brockstone Court, in a park. I don't see the village, though. No, sir, you wouldn't see no village of Brockstone. There ain't only the court and the chapel at Brockstone. Chapel? Oh, yes, that's marked here, too. The chapel, close by the court, it seems to be. Does it belong to the court? Yes, sir, that's close up to the court, only a step. Yes, that belonged to the court. My daughter, you see, sir, she's the keeper's wife now, and she live at the court and look after things now the family's away. No one living there now, then? No, sir, not for a number of years. The old gentleman, he lived there when I was a lad, and the lady she lived on after him to very near ninety years of age. And then she died, and them that have it now, they've got this other place, in Warwickshire, I believe it is, and they don't do nothing about letting the court out. But Colonel Wildman, he have the shooting, and young Mr. Clark, he's the agent, he come over once in so many weeks to see things, and my daughter's husband, he's the keeper. And who uses the chapel? Just the people round bout, I suppose. Oh, no, no one don't use the chapel. Why, there ain't no one to go. All the people about, they go to Stanford St. Thomas Church. But my son-in-law, he go to Kingsburn Church now. Because the gentleman at Stanford, he have this Gregory singing, and my son-in-law, he don't like that. He say he can hear the old donkey brayin' any day of the week, and he likes something a little cheerful on the Sunday. The old man drew his hand across his mouth and laughed. That's what my son-in-law say. He say he can hear the old donkey. Mr. Davidson also laughed as honestly as he could, thinking, meanwhile, that Brockstone Court and Chapel would probably be worth including in his walk, 
for the map showed that from Brockstone he could easily strike the Tent Valley quite as easily as by following the main Kingburn Log Bridge Road. So, when the mirth excited by the remembrance of the son-in-law's bon mot had died down, he returned to the charge and ascertained that both the court and the chapel were of the class known as old-fashioned places, and that the old man would be very willing to take him thither, and his daughter would be happy to show him whatever she could. But that ain't a lot, sir, not as if the family was living there. All the looking-glasses is covered up, and the paintings and the curtains and the carpets folded away, not but what I dare say she can show you a pair to just to look at, because she go over them to see as the morse shouldn't get into them. I shan't mind about that, thank you, if she can show me the inside of the chapel. That's what I'd like best to see. Oh, she can show you that right enough, sir. She have the key of the door, you see, and most weeks she go in and dust about. That's a nice chapel, that is. My son-in-law, he say he'll be bound that they didn't have none of this Gregory singing there. Dear, I can't help but smile when I think of him saying that about the old donkey. I can hear him bray, he say, any day of the week. And so he can, sir, that's true, anyway. The walk across the fields from Kingburn to Brockstone was very pleasant. It lay for the most part on the top of the country, and commanded wide views over a succession of ridges, plow and pasture, or covered with dark blue woods, all ending, more or less abruptly, on the right, in the headlands that overlooked the wide valley of a great western river. The last field they crossed was bounded by a close copse, and no sooner were they in it than the path turned downwards very sharply, and it became evident that Brockstone was very neatly fitted into a sudden and very narrow valley. It was not long before they had glimpses of groups of smokeless stone chimneys and stone-tiled roofs close beneath their feet, and not many minutes after that they were wiping their shoes at the back door of Brockstone Court, while the keeper's dogs barked very loudly in unseen places, and Mrs. Porter in quick succession screamed at them to be quiet, greeted her father, and begged both of her visitors to step in. It was not to be expected that Mr. Davidson should escape being taken through the principal rooms of the court, in spite of the fact that the house was entirely out of commission. Pictures, carpets, curtains, furniture, all were covered up or put away, as old Mr. Avery had said, and the admiration which our friend was very ready to bestow had to be lavished on the proportions of the rooms, and on the one painted ceiling, upon which an artist who had fled from London in the plague year, had depicted the triumph of loyalty and defeat of sedition. In this, Mr. Davidson could show an unfeigned interest. The portraits of Cromwell, Ireton, Bradshaw, Peters, and the rest, writhing in carefully devised torments, were evidently the parts of the design to which most pains had been devoted. That was old Lady Sadler who had that painting done, same as the one put up in the chapel. They say she were the first that went up to London to dance on Oliver Cromwell's grave. So said Mr. Avery, and continued musingly, Well, I suppose she got some satisfaction to her mind, but I don't know that I should want to pay the fare to London and back just for that. And my son-in-law, he say the same. He say he don't know as he should have cared to pay all that money only for that. I was telling the gentleman as we come along on the train, Mary, what your Harry says about this Gregory singing down at the Stanford here. We all had a bit of laugh over that, sir, didn't us? Yes, to be sure we did. Ha ha! Once again Mr. Davidson strove to do justice to the pleasantry of the keeper. But, he said, if Mrs. Porter can show me the chapel, I think it should be now, for the days aren't long, and I want to get back to Longbridge before it falls quite dark. Even if Brockstone Court has not been illustrated in rural life, and I think it has not, I do not propose to point out its excellences here, but of the chapel a word must be said. It stands about a hundred yards from the house, and has its own little graveyard and trees about it. It is a stone building, about seventy feet long, and in the Gothic style, as that style was understood in the middle of the seventeenth century. On the whole, it resembles some of the Oxford College chapels as much as anything, save that it has a distinct chancel, like a parish church, and a fanciful dome bell turret at the southwest angle. When the west door was thrown open, Mr. Davidson could not repress an exclamation of pleased surprise at the completeness and richness of the interior. Screenwork, pulpit, seating, and glass, all were of the same period, and as he advanced to the nave and sighted the organ case with its gold-embossed pipes in the western gallery, his cup of satisfaction was filled. The glass in the nave windows was chiefly armorial, and the chancel were figure subjects, of the kind that might be seen at Abbey Doré, 
of Lord Scudamore's work, but this is not an archaeological review. While Mr. Davidson was still busy examining the remains of the organ, attributed to one of the Dalums, I believe, old Mr. Avery had stumped up into the chancel and was lifting the dust cloths from the blue velvet cushions of the stall desks. Evidently it was here that the family sat. Mr. Davidson heard him say in a rather hushed tone of surprise, Why, Mary, there's all the books open again. The reply was in a voice that sounded peevish rather than surprised. Tut, tut, tut. Well, there, I never. Mrs. Porter went over to where her father was standing, and they continued talking in a lower key. Mr. Davidson saw plainly that something not quite in the common run was under discussion, so he came down the gallery stairs and joined them. There was no sign of disorder in the chancel any more than in the rest of the chapel, which was beautifully clean, but the eight folio prayer books on the cushions of the stall desks were indubitably open. Mrs. Porter was inclined to be fretful over it. "'Whoever can be as does it,' she said. "'For there's no key but mine, nor yet door but the one we came in by, and the windows is barred, every one of them. I don't like it, Father, that I don't.' "'What is it, Mrs. Porter? Anything wrong?' said Mr. Davidson. "'No, sir, nothing really wrong, only these books. Every time pretty near that I come in to do up the place, I shuts them and spreads the cloths over them to keep off the dust, ever since Mr. Clark spoke about it when I first come. And yet there they are again, and always the same page. And as I says, whoever it can be as does it with the door and windows shut, and as I says, it makes anyone feel queer coming in here alone as I have to do, not as I'm given that way myself, not to be frightened easy, I mean to say, and there's not a rat in the place. Not as no rat wouldn't trouble to do a thing like that, do you think, sir? Hardly, I should say, but it sounds very queer. Are they always open at the same place, did you say? Always the same place, sir. One of the Psalms it is, and I didn't particularly notice it the first time or two, till I see a little red line of printing, and it's always caught my eye since. Mr. Davidson walked along the stalls and looked at the open books. Sure enough, they all stood open at the same page, Psalm 109, and at the head of it, just between the number and the den's laudum, was a rubric for the 25th day of April. Without pretending to minute knowledge of the history of the Book of Common Prayer, he knew enough to be sure that this was a very odd and wholly unauthorized addition to its text, and though he remembered that April is St. Mark's Day, he could not imagine what appropriateness this very savage psalm could have had at that festival. With slight misgivings, he ventured to turn over the leaves to examine the title page, and knowing the need for particular accuracy in these matters, he devoted some ten minutes to making a line-for-line -line transcript of it. The date was 1653. The printer called himself Anthony Cadman. He turned to the list of proper psalms for certain days. Yes, added to it was that same inexplicable entry. For the 25th day of April, the Moth Psalm. An expert would no doubt have thought of many other points to inquire into, but this antiquary, as I have said, was no expert. He took stock, however, of the binding, a handsome one of tool blue leather, bearing the arms that figured in several of the nave windows in various combinations. How often, he said at last to Mrs. Porter, have you found these books lying open like this? Really, I couldn't say, sir, but it's been a great many times now. Do you recollect, Father, me telling you about it the first time I noticed it? That I do, my dear. You was in a rare taking, and I don't so much wonder at it, that it was five year ago I was paying you a visit at Michaelmas time, and you came in at tea time, and says you, Father, there's the books laying open under the cloths again, and I didn't know what my daughter was speaking about, you see, sir, and I says, books? Just like that, I says. Then it all came out. But as Harry says, that's my son-in-law, sir, whoever it can be, he says, as does it, because there ain't only the one door, and we keeps the key locked up, he says, and the winders barred, every one of em. Well, he says, I lay once I could catch him at it, they wouldn't do it a second time, he says. And no more they wouldn't, I don't believe, sir. Well, that was five years ago, and it's been happening constant ever since by your account, my dear. Young Mr. Clark, he don't seem to think much to it, but then he don't live up here, you see. And tisn't his business to come up and clean up here in a dark afternoon, is it? 
I suppose you never notice anything else odd when you are at work in here, Mrs. Porter, said Mr. Davidson. No, sir, I do not, said Mrs. Porter. And it's a funny thing to me I don't, with the feeling I have as if there's someone sitting there. No, it's the other side, just within the screen, and looking at me all the time I'm dusting in the gallery and pews. But I never see nothing worse than myself, as the saying goes, and I kindly hope I never may. In the conversation that followed, there was not much of it. Nothing was added to the statement of the case. Having parted on good terms with Mr. Avery and his daughter, Mr. Davidson addressed himself to his eight-mile walk. The little valley of Brockstone soon led him down into the broader one of the tent, and on to Stanford St. Thomas, where he found refreshment. We need not accompany him all the way to Longbridge. But as he was changing his socks before dinner, he suddenly paused and said half aloud, By Jove, that is a rum thing. It had not occurred to him before how strange it was that any edition of the prayer book should have been issued in 1653, seven years before the Restoration, five years before Cromwell's death, and when the use of the book, let alone the printing of it, was penal. He must have been a bold man who put his name and a date on that title page. Only, Mr. Davidson reflected, it probably was not his name of all, for the ways of printers in difficult times were devious. As he was in the front hall of the Swan that evening, making some investigations about trains, a small motor stopped in front of the door, and out of it came a small man in a fur coat, who stood on the steps and gave directions in a rather yapping foreign accent to his chauffeur. When he came into the hotel, he was seen to be black-haired and pale-faced, with a little pointed beard and a gold pince nez, altogether very neatly turned out. He went to his room, and Mr. Davidson saw no more of him till dinner time. As they were the only two dining that night, it was not difficult for the newcomer to find an excuse for falling into talk. He was evidently wishing to make out what brought Mr. Davidson into that neighborhood at that season. Can you tell me how far it is from here to Arlingworth? was one of his early questions, and it was one which threw some light on his own plans. For Mr. Davidson recollected having seen at the station an advertisement of a sale at Arlingworth Hall, comprising old furniture, pictures, and books. This, then, was a London dealer. No, he said, I have never been there. I believe it lies out by Kingsburn. It can't be more than twelve miles. I see there's a sale there shortly. The other looked at him inquisitively, and he laughed. No, he said, as if answering a question. You needn't be afraid of my competing. I'm leaving this place tomorrow. This cleared the air, and the dealer, whose name was Hamburger, admitted he was interested in books, and thought there might be in these old country house libraries something to repay a journey. For, said he, we English have always this marvelous talent for accumulating rarities in the most unexpected places, ain't it? And in the course of the evening he was most interesting on the subject of finds made by himself and others. I shall take the occasion after this sale to look around the district a bit. Perhaps you can inform me of any likely spots, Mr. Davidson. But Davidson though he had seen some very tempting locked-up bookcases at Brockstone Court, kept his counsel. He did not really like Mr. Homburger. The next day, as he sat in the train, a little ray of light came to illuminate one of yesterday's puzzles. He happened to take out an almanac diary that he had bought for the new year, and it occurred to him to look at the remarkable events for April 25. There it was. St. Mark, Oliver Cromwell born, 1599. That, coupled with the painted ceiling, seemed to explain a good deal. The figure of old Lady Sadlier became more substantial to his imagination, as of one in whom love for church and king had gradually given place to intense hate of the power that had silenced the one and slaughtered the other. What curious evil service was that which she and a few like her had been wont to celebrate year by year in that remote valley? And how in the world had she managed to elude authority? And again, did not this persistent opening of the books agree oddly with the other traits of her portrait known to him? It would be interesting for anyone who chanced to be near Brookstone on the 25th of April to look in at the chapel and see if anything exceptional happened. When he came to think of it, there seemed to be no reason why he should not be that person himself. He, and if possible, some congenial friend. He resolved that so it should be. Knowing that he knew really nothing about the printing of prayer books, he realized that he must make it his business to get the best light on the matter without divulging his reasons. 
I must say at once that his search was entirely fruitless. One writer of the early part of the 19th century, a writer of rather windy and rhapsodical chat about books, professed to have heard of a special anti-Cromwellian issue of the prayer book in the very midst of the Commonwealth period, but he did not claim to have seen a copy, and no one had believed him. Looking into this matter, Mr. Davidson found that the statement was based on letters from a correspondent who had lived near Longbridge, so he was inclined to think that the Brockstone prayer books were at the bottom of it and had excited a momentary interest. Months went on, and St. Mark's Day came near. Nothing interfered with Mr. Davidson's plan of visiting Brockstone, or with those of the friend who he had persuaded to go with him, and to whom alone he had confided the puzzle. The same 945 train which had taken him in January took them now to Kingsburn. The same field path led them to Brockstone, but today they stopped more than once to pick a cowslip. The distant woods and ploughed uplands were of another color, and in the copse there was, as Mrs. Porter said, a regular charm of birds, while you couldn't hardly collect your mind sometimes with it. She recognized Mr. Davidson at once, and was very ready to do the honors of the chapel. The new visitor, Mr. Witham, was as much struck by the completeness of it as Mr. Davidson had been. There can't be such another in England, he said. Books open again, Mrs. Porter, said Davidson, as they walked up to the chancel. Dear, yes, I expect so, sir, said Mrs. Porter, and she drew off the cloths. Well, there, she exclaimed the next moment, if they ain't shut. That's the first time I've ever found them so. But it's not for want of care on my part, I do assure you, gentlemen. If they wasn't, for I felt the cloth the last thing before I shut up last week, when the gentleman was done photographing the east window, and every one was shut, and where there was ribbons left I tied them. Now I think of it, I don't remember having ever have done that before, and perhaps whoever it is just made the difference to him. Well, it only shows, don't it? If at first you don't succeed, try, try, try again. Meanwhile the two men had been examining the books, and now Davidson spoke. I'm sorry to say I'm afraid there's something wrong here, Mrs. Porter. These are not the same books. It would make too long a business to detail all Mrs. Porter's outcries and the questions that followed. The upshot was this. Early in January, the gentleman had come over to see the chapel and thought a great deal of it and said he must come back in the spring weather and take some photographs. And only a week ago, he had drove up in his motoring car and a very heavy box with the sides in it and she had locked him in because he said something about a long explosion, and she was afraid of some damage happening, and he says, no, not explosion, but it appeared the lantern what they take the slides with worked very slow, and so he was in there the best part of an hour, and she come and let him out, and he drove off with his box and all, and gave her his visiting card, and oh dear, dear, to think of such a thing. He must have changed the books and took the old ones away with him in his box. What sort of man was he? Oh, dear, he was a small maid gentleman, if you can call him so after the way he behaved, with black hair, that is, if it was hair, and gold eyeglasses, if they were gold. Really, one don't know what to believe. Sometimes I doubt he weren't a real Englishman at all, and yet he seemed to know the language, and had the name on his visiting card like anybody else might. Just so, may we see the card? Yes, T.W. Henderson, and an address somewhere near Bristol. Well, Mrs. Porter, it's quite plain that this Mr. Henderson, as he calls himself, has walked off with your eight prayer books and put eight others about the same size in place of them. Now listen to me. I suppose you must tell your husband about this, but neither you nor he must say one word about it to anyone else. If you'll give me the address of the agent, Mr. Clark, isn't it? I'll write to him to tell him exactly what has happened, and that it really is no fault of yours. But you understand, we must keep it very quiet. And why? Because this man who has stolen the books will, of course, try to sell them one at a time. For I may tell you that they are worth a good deal of money, and the only way we can bring it home to him is by keeping a sharp lookout and saying nothing. By dint of repeating the same advice in various forms, they succeeded in impressing Mrs. Porter with the real need for silence, and were forced to make a concession only in the case of Mr. Avery, who was expected on a visit shortly. But you may be safe with father, sir, said Mrs. Porter. Father ain't a talkin' man. It was not quite Mr. Davidson's experience of him. Still, there were no neighbors at Brockstone, 
and even Mr. Avery must be aware that gossip with anybody on such a subject would be likely to end in the porters having to look out for another situation. A last question was whether Mr. Henderson, so-called, had anyone with him. No, sir, not when he come he hadn't. He was working his own motoring car himself. And what luggage he had? Let me see. There was his lantern and this box of slides inside the carriage, which I helped him into the chapel and out of it myself with it, if only I'd knowed. And as he drove away under the big yew tree by the monument, I see the long white bundle laying on top of the coach, what I didn't notice when he drove up. But he sat in front, sir, and only the boxes inside behind him. And do you really think, sir, as his name weren't Henderson at all? Oh, dear me, what a dreadful thing. Why, fancy what trouble it must bring to an innocent person that might never have set foot in the place but for that. They left Mrs. Porter in tears. On the way home there was much discussion as to the best means of keeping watch upon possible sales. What Henderson Homburger, for there could be no real doubt of the identity, had done was, obviously, to bring down the requisite number of folio prayer books, disused copies from college chapels and the like, bought ostensibly for the sake of the bindings, which were superficially like enough to the old ones, and to substitute them at his leisure for the genuine articles. A week had now passed without any public notice being taken of the theft. He would take a little time himself to find out about the rarity of the books, and would ultimately, no doubt, place them cautiously. Between them, Davidson and Witham were in a position to know a good deal of what was passing in the book world, and they could map out the ground pretty completely. A weak point with them at the moment was that neither of them knew under what other name or names Henderson Homburger carried on business. But there are ways of solving these problems. And yet, all this planning proved unnecessary. We are transported to a London office on the same 25th of April. We find there, within closed doors, late in the day, two police inspectors, a commissioner, and a youthful clerk. The two latter, both rather pale and agitated in appearance, are sitting on chairs and being questioned. How long do you say you've been in this Mr. Poshwitz's employment? Six months? And what was his business? Attended sales in various parts and brought home parcels of books. Did he keep a shop anywhere? No. No? Disposed of them right here and there, and sometimes to private collectors. Right. Now then, when did he go out last? Rather better than a week ago. Tell you where he was going? No. Said he was going to start next day from his private residence and shouldn't be at the office. That's here, eh? Before two days. You was to attend as usual. Where is his private residence? Oh, that's the address, Norwood Way, I see. Any family? Not in this country? Now then, what account do you give of what's happened since he came back? Came back on the Tuesday, did he? And this is the Saturday. Bring any books? One package. Where is it? In the safe. You got the key? No, to be sure. It's open, of course. How did he seem when he got back? Cheerful? Well, but how do you mean curious? Thought he might be in for an illness. He said that, did he? Odd smell got in his nose. Couldn't get rid of it. Told you to let him know who wanted to see him before you let him in? That wasn't unusual with him? Much the same all Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Out a good deal. Said he was going to the British Museum. Often went to make inquiries and in the way of his business. Walked up and down a lot in the office when he was in? Anyone call in on those days? Mostly when he was out. Anyone find him in? Oh, Mr. Collinson? Who's Mr. Collinson? An old customer. Know his address? All right, give it to us afterwards. Well, now, what about this morning? You left Mr. Poshwitz's here at twelve and went home. Anybody see you? Commissioner, you did? Remained at home till summoned here. Very well. Now, Commissioner, we have your name, Watkins, eh? Very well, make your statement. Don't go too quick, so as we can get it down. I was on duty here later than usual, Mr. Postwich asking me to remain on, and ordering his lunching to be sent in, which come as ordered. I was in the lobby from 11.30 on, and I see Mr. Bly, the clerk, leave at about 12. After that, no one come in at all, except Mr. Postwich's lunching came in at 1 o'clock, and the man left in five minutes' time. Towards the afternoon, I became tired of waiting, and I come upstairs to this first floor. The outer door what lead to the office stood open, 
and I come up to the plate glass door here. Mr. Postwich, he was standing behind a table smoking a cigar, and he laid it down on the mantelpiece and felt in his trouser pockets and took out a key and went across to the safe. And I knocked on the glass, thinking to see if he wanted me to come and take away his tray, but he didn't take no notice, being engaged with the safe door. Then he got it open and stooped down and seemed to be lifting up a package off the floor of the safe. And then, sir, I see what looked like to be a great roll of old shabby white flannel, about four or five feet high, fall forwards out of the inside of the safe, right against Mr. Postwich's shoulder, as he was stooping over. And Mr. Postwich, he raised himself up, as it were, resting his hands on the package, and gave an exclamation. And I can't hardly expect you should take what I says, but as true as I stand here, I see this roll had a kind of face in the upper end of it, sir. You can't be more surprised than what I was, I can assure you, and I've seen a lot in my time. Yes, I can describe it if you wish it, sir. It was very much the same as this wall here in color. The wall had an earth-colored distemper, and it had a bit of a band tied around underneath, and the eyes, well, they were dry-like, much as if there were two big spider's bodies in the halls. Hair? No, I don't know as there was much hair to be seen. The flannel stuff was over the top of the head. I'm very sure it wasn't what it should have been. No, I only seen it in a flash, but I took it in like a photograph. Wish I hadn't. Yes, sir, it fell right over onto Mr. Postwich's shoulder, and this face hid in his neck. Yes, sir, about where the injury was. More like a ferret going for a rabbit than anything else. And he rolled over, and of course I tried to get in at the door. But as you know, sir, it was locked on the inside, and all I could do, I rung up everyone, and the surgeon came, and the police, and you gentlemen, and you know as much as what I do. If you won't be requiring me any more today, I'll be glad to be getting off home. It shook me up more than I thought for. Well, said one of the inspectors when they were left alone, and, well, said the other inspector, and, after a pause, what's the surgeon's report again? You've got it there. Yes. Effect on the blood like the worst kind of snake bite. Death almost instantaneous. I'm glad of that for his sake. He was a nasty sight. No case for detaining this man Watkins, anyway. We know all about him. And what about this safe now? We'd better go over it again. And, by the way, we haven't opened that package you was busy with when he died. Well, handle it careful, said the other. There might be this snake in it, for all you know. Get a light around the corners of the place, too. Well, there's room for a shortish person to stand up in. But what about ventilation? Perhaps, said the other slowly, as he explored the safe with an electric torch. Perhaps they didn't require much of that. My word, it strikes warm coming out of that place. Like a vault it is. But here, what's this bank like of dust all spread out into the room? That must have come here since the door was open. It would sweep it all away if you moved it. See? Now what do you make of that? Make of it? About as much as I make of anything else in this case. One of London's mysteries this is going to be by what I can see, and I don't believe a photographer's box full of large-size old-fashioned prayer books is going to take as much further, for that's just what your package is. It was a natural but hasty utterance. The preceding narrative shows that there was in fact plenty of material for constructing a case, and when once Messrs. Davidson and Witham had brought their end to Scotland Yard, the join-up was soon made and the circle completed. To the relief of Mrs. Porter, the owners of Brockstone decided not to replace the books in the chapel. They repose, I believe, in a safe deposit in town. The police have their own methods of keeping certain matters out of the newspapers. Otherwise, it can hardly be supposed that Watkins' evidence about Mr. Poshwitz's death could have failed to furnish a good many headlines of startling character to the press. The End